Again, Erev Shabbos, everybody. Welcome to Jerry's Parsha Ponderings for Parshat Shlach. I haven't recorded a video in a number of weeks, primarily because of the war. Um, my head just really wasn't in it, so I apologize for that. But uh, let's get back into it. And there probably is no better Parsha than uh, Shlach to restart our our weekly Divrei Torah. So... Parshat Shlach, the quintessential Ahavas Eretz Yisrael Parsha, as we learned um, just how devastating it is when Dibat Haaretz, when people slander the land, don't appreciate the land, and just in general pretend that Eretz Yisrael is just unimportant and disassociated from the rest of Yiddishkeit. And I think that with what we've seen in the last few weeks, and I will try to bring all of that in in a 10-minute video that'll probably go to 20 minutes, um, I think we have seen it with our own eyes exactly how Hashem appreciates when we appreciate his gifts and how much we suffer when we don't. So who were these Maraglim? Let's start with that. Who were the Maraglim? Well, the Torah tells us their names and that Rashi B'nai Yisrael Hema, Nesie Eida, Kriye Moed, Anshe Shame, we're not talking about some street punks. We're not talking about some near do wells, some Erevrav, punk fakert. We are talking about people that were the leaders of Am Yisrael, the Nasim, the Nasim, the, 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 the princes, the, the aristocrats, the aristocracy of Am Yisrael. And what did they do? Well, they, the people wanted to send forth spies. So Hashem tells Moshe, Shlach lecha. you want to send spies? Gazunta hates send spies. Knock yourself out. And they go, they come back, and we know what they say. Yes, the land is flowing with milk and honey. Yes, it is a beautiful land. There is the I alone going through Tel Aviv. It is the startup nation. It is the quintessential startup nation. The a slave people came in and turned the desert into a garden years ago, in days of yore, before uh, 1948, and not before the Aliyah Rishonah and the Aliyah Shnia. And they came back and they said all these wonderful things about the land. F.S. However, however, there are people, Anshe Midot, they are the, the Anakim, the Bene, which, which doesn't necessarily mean they were giants, but they were, they say giants, but it, it means that they were substantial people they had their they had their stuff together they had uh a, 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 an imposing military an imposing military almost like seven nations against one but we'll get to that in a little bit and that we are not necessarily going to be able to do this um we are grasshoppers. We're like bugs compared to them. How could we possibly stand up against this nation? No, no, they said, it is much better that we stay here in the desert. Leich Lekras Moshe Hamid Bara. We'll get to that in a second. Better off staying here under the cloud of glory, learning from the Rebbe, the quintessential Rebbe, who was a greater Rebbe than Moshe Rabbeinu, Rabbi Isai. Moshe Rabbeinu was their Rebbe. Learning, not having to worry about anything. Their Gashmias was all taken care of. They had mun falling from the heaven. Their clothes grew with them. They never needed to go buy new shoes, Rabbi Isai. They had it all. Why should we have to go into the land? We go into the land. 
We have to fight. We have to join the military. We have to go make a living. You go into the land, there's no mun. You have to turn the desert into a garden. You have to drain the swamps. Get rid of the malaria and the mosquitoes. And you have to start a functioning society. What's going to be with the Torah? Here we are in the desert. We have everything. We have everything. Hashem takes care of everything. We don't even have to go out and fundraise. Torah Matahei Aleha. The people said, hey, they have a good point. No, why should we? They're right. What do we need this for? Maybe we'll go back to Egypt. We were doing very well in Egypt after the whole slavery piece. We were able to start businesses. We were able to, uh, they started already base medrashes. I, four-fifths of the people, 80% died because they didn't want to leave. All right, that was then, we'll go back. Why should we have to deal with building a society? This was the claim of the Maraglan. They were people, don't make no mistake. Make no mistake, they were not, they were not Eiswarfen. They were not ne'er-do-wells, as I said earlier. These were the creme de la creme. Don't worry about this guy named Hitler. He'll go away. Stay right where you are. Don't, don't grab on to what the Zionists are telling you. Sound familiar? The Chet HaMaraglam, and, and really in this week's Pasha, there's so much to talk about, but after what we've just been through, we have to put in perspective what has happened in the last year or two, and especially in the last month, in the last few weeks, with the war, with Operation Shomrei HaChomot. And we really have to look at this in the... In, in the lens, through the lens, of Parshat Shlach in particular. And that's really why I chose to restart these videos this week. And after the war, I just had to talk about this. Rabo say, we were forgiven for the Egel Hazav. God forgave us for that. We did away with idolatry. All right, there were... There were, there were uh, some periods, this king, that king. All right. But you don't see people today bowing down to statues. Baruch Hashem. There are other idolatries. Could be an iPhone. It could be the internet. It could be money. It could be, there are other idolatries. Let's just say that. But bowing down to gold statues, Baruch Hashem, pretty much we've gotten away from that. The sin of the spies, not so much. Not so much. Now, I'm going to hearken back to earlier this week, um, Baruch Hashem, we finally celebrated my parents' um, 60th wedding anniversary, their diamond wedding anniversary. And... We did this, my daughter Shandy did this beautiful matzeget, a beautiful presentation going back over their years. It was very, it was very meaningful. Um, <clears throat> but I, I got up and I spoke and I was thinking of what could I say? What could I say to my parents about what they've given us, my sister and I? my sister and me. My rookie's an English teacher. I can't make those kind of mistakes. And as I was growing up, when we were growing up in New York City, Forest Hills, the Altaheim, my parents never bought a property in the United States. Not that they couldn't, but when all my friends were moving into houses, my father always said, we don't want to own anything in Chutz Laaretz. And any time my father from his business got some money together, 
we would go to Israel and he'd buy property in Israel, which is where they live now in Netanya, on that same property. And I was brought up with Chutz Aretz is temporary. We don't want to settle down here. We, our future is in Eretz Yisrael. And I grew up, that was literally my mother's milk growing up. That's how we were raised. We were Talmidim of Rav Kahana, that Jews have to be strong, especially after what happened in the Holocaust. And my parents were not Holocaust survivors, but on both sides, plenty. But we were taught our home is in Eretz Yisrael. Ein lanu Eretz Acheret. That is where we need to be. And let me tell you, and, and, that, and I thank them. I thank my parents saying the greatest gift I could have been given was love of Eretz Yisrael. And I grew up with that 100%. It was never even a thought that we would ever end up anywhere else. Baruch Hashem. Let me tell you another story while we're telling stories. Years ago, my wife and I, Ruchi and I, were driving through Lakewood with her aunt, her aunt Tabsha. She was the eldest of my father-in-law Zatzal's sisters, and his two older brothers, my father-in-law was a survivor of the Holocaust, his two eldest brothers, um, Yosef and Eliezer were killed by the Nazis. And they, uh, she was the eldest of the surviving sisters. And we were driving through Lakewood. This is years ago. I got to say 30 years ago. 25, 30 years ago. And Ruchi come, and Ruchi grew up in Lakewood. But when Ruchi grew up in Lakewood, Ruchi went to Lakewood High School. When she grew up in Lakewood, the from area in Lakewood was just the square around the MG, around the yeshiva, around Beit Medrash Gavoa. And now it's in five towns already. The five towns are Lakewood, Howell, we could like the five towns in, in New York, right? Lakewood, Howell, Brick, Jackson, and Tom's River. Those are the five towns. It's all, it's spread far and wide. I won't say Baruch Hashem because I don't consider it a bracha. Um, I won't say Rachman Litzlan because we're not there yet. But anyway, so Ruchi commented to Tabshi, her aunt, saying, Wow, Tanta, look, look at how. I can't believe this is the same Lakewood I grew up in. Look at all these beautiful homes that the Yidden are building. And Tubshi looks at her and she says in her heavily accented English, Ruchala, this is nishtgit. This is not good. And Ruchi goes, why not? She goes, and this is Yiddish, I'll translate. Yiddish Ahizen of Goyesh Agassin. They're Jewish homes, but they're on Gaiisha streets. I've seen this before. I know how it ends. And boy, did I get chills up and down my spine. Yiddish Ahizen of Gaiisha Gassen. This Rabbi Sai is the Chet HaMaraglim. Why were we not forgiven for Chet HaMaraglim? Why do we still cry on Tisha B'Av? Why was Bayez Rishon and Bayez Shani destroyed on Oisai Halayla Vayivku Ha'am Balayla Ha'hu? Because we haven't, we haven't rectified the sin. We're, we're sinning this every single day. What are we going to tell HaKadosh Baruch Hu? After 120 years. The, the Maraglim had very from intentions. They meant well. Their intentions were for the betterment of Am Yisrael. They didn't see how a ragtag nation of uh, slaves would go in and fight the Yili Anuk. What did it mean? They, they great people with powerful armies, seven of them. 
They didn't trust in Hashem. They meant very well. They did. They said, they, we were like grasshoppers in their eyes, and so too in our own. They felt like bugs next to the Yilidei Anuk. That they were, that they, they, and these are the people that saw 10 plagues, Kriyas Yamsuf, the Melchema, the Melchema with Amalek, water coming out of a rock. But they were worried about Torah Mataheyaleha. How are we going to go serve in an army? When are we going to learn? Pregnant pause, giving you a second to think about that. Now, we just had another one of our little skirmishes in the sand with our cousins from Gaza. Milchemet Shomrei Hachomot. Mivza Shomrei Hachomot. Guarding the walls. What was the world reaction? Am Yisrael sitting on our land. We're here. Baruch Hashem. They're shooting at missiles over at us. We have the Iron Dome. <laughs> the Iron Dome, which is a mixed blessing, because every missile that comes over should be treated as if it killed thousands of people, even though we shoot them out of the sky. And don't for one second think we're shooting anything out of the sky. That's the, the, the Iron Dome is the hand of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. If you don't realize that, your brain is broken. What was the IDF, the most moral army in the world? No question about it. We do things that nobody ever did and nobody, quite frankly, should do. You don't tell the enemy that you're about to bomb them. That, my friends, is stupid. If you know where the enemy is and you're in the middle of a war, you kill them. That's what a war is. No one wants there to be a war. If they didn't shoot at us, we wouldn't. When, when did Israel ever start a war? You want to say the Six Day War? We took the first shot. Okay, we would have been dead if we didn't. They were coming. We all knew it. They said they were going to. So technically, we really didn't start that fire with apologies to Billy Joel. But. So we, they start, we fire back. What does the world say? Baby killer, apartheid, genocide. Oh, wow, yeah, we're committing genocide against the Arabs. It's very obvious, seeing that the uh, Arab population in the entire area since 1948, what, quintupled? Jews are usually pretty good at what we do. You know, I mean, you know, let's face it. Everyone wants a Jewish lawyer, a Jewish accountant, a Jewish doctor. We suck at genocide. I mean, the world says we're committing genocide. We really got to sharpen our game here, don't you think? That's sarcasm. Um, so what did they do? Regardless of what happened in Israel, they're, they're committing pogroms against Jews in New York, Los Angeles, France, Great Britain, the whole world. Why do you think that is? What is a Jew living in New York? How is that Jew responsible for what's going on here in Israel? Especially since we're defending ourselves. We're, we, we're not intentionally killing anyone. We're defending ourselves. But yet they're attacking Jews in the streets, in Chutzlaret, in, in the diaspora. Why? Any ideas? Think about it. Are, are they really upset about the Zionist entity that Jews in Israel are firing back? Maybe. Probably. They're upset because there is a Jew walking around breathing somewhere. That's what's upsetting them. We have no where else in the world? And yes, we get fired upon. 
but I would throw down any day in Israel with the IDF and the IAF rather than take my chances on the streets of Chutzlaretz because we've got only ourselves. Look at what's coming out from BLM. One of the leaders of BLM this week said that Palestine is our generation South Africa and that it is our job to rid the world of Israel, unquote. This is what we are up against. Why are we up against this? Because we never repented for the sin of Chet HaMaraglim. We are, we are getting these reminders often and frequently. And whatever Hamas throws at us, we'll be fine. And yes, we take every precaution to try to minimize civilian casualties. Whether or not that's such a great idea is a discussion for another day. But this is what we're living with, and this is the reality on the ground in New York, in Los Angeles, in Chicago, in London, in Paris, in Sydney and Melbourne, in Johannesburg and Cape Town, everywhere. We are being sent a message, and it would behoove us to listen to it loud and clear. Now, one more point. There is a governmental brouhaha going on here in the Holy Land between Naftali Bennett and Bibi Netanyahu and who's sitting with whom and, and, and Sa'ar and Tamar Zandberg. Uh, I shouldn't even say that name on a Dva Torah. And, and uh, all, all these other characters. Regardless of which way this goes, let me just say that with all his warts and wrinkles, Bibi Netanyahu was arguably the greatest prime minister Israel's ever seen, and everybody owes him a debt of gratitude. Le le basic Hakara Satov. Same way I felt about President Trump. When someone does a good thing, you say thank you. Uh, is he long in the tooth? Is his time getting a bit long? Fine. We, we, can make, we can make that argument, but the bottom line is that Hakara Satov is due, so let's give it. Whether or not he continues on, it looks unlikely, and I'm all for term limits, but this isn't a political, this isn't a political speech. But let's just remember something. Biden, Trump, Bennett, Bibi, Lapid, whomever, Hamlucha v'hamem shala l'chai olamim. Lev melachem v'sarim biyad Hashem. Ultimately, whomever winds up in the big chair in Jerusalem is who Hashem wants there. And let's remember that. And let's try to, you know, tone down the nasty rhetoric. And I mean that both here in Israel and in Chutz Laaretz. Don't worry, we've been through <laughs> much more difficult uh, times than we are in now, Baruch Hashem. And if Bennett, if Naftali Bennett does wind up as prime minister, I, for one, for however long or short it is, will be very happy to see somebody who wears the kippah, who is Shimer Shabbos, and for real, who puts on tefillin every day and davens three times a day as my prime minister. So let's see how it all plays out. And remember, hamlucha v'hamem shala, l'chai olamim. Rabbi say Shabbos yimakar ha-bracha, Shabbos shlach, let's sit down, talk about the parsha. Oh my God, there's so much to talk about. So let's talk to our children as my parents did to me about the importance of Yishev Eretz Yisrael, how ein lanu Eretz Acheret. And uh, let's teach our children how lucky we are to be here if you are here and how lucky they will be to be here when they get here and realize 
that ain lanu eretz acheret. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Thank you for joining me again. I hope to keep this up and uh, make it a great weekend, a great Shabbos. Shabbat shalom.